So we'll now discuss saliency map techniques, which are a particular kind of feature importance method. So we'll cook the setting we'll consider is that we have a model F theta here. You can think of this as your favorite um, deep network, Conception V3, Resonance 50, or VGJ16. And this model is given a prediction of Junko bird on this particular input. One question we might now be interested in answering is what are the parts of this input that the model relies on in order to give a prediction Junko bird? And one kind of answer we can give is a heat map that shows the relevance of each input dimension towards the output of the output prediction of this model. And this is exactly what silly heat map techniques provide. And uh, they often call future attribution methods or heat maps in the literature. In the rest of this tutorial, we'll essentially just call these methods uh, CDAC map techniques. So before we actually discuss um, CDAC map techniques, let's take a quick look at a linear model because linear models are very instructive and can give us insights that might be able to translate to the deep neural network setting. So let's say we have a model at the W transpose X where X is in RD, D dimensions. Uh, we can ask a question about the sensitivity. And this question is of the form, how, how much does a unit change in, each input, in an input dimension induced in the output? And the answer to this, you can sort of compute the sensitivity um, as a gradient that gives you the essentially the weights of the model. And here the gradient is the input gradient, so you compute a derivative of the output with respect to the input, and you essentially get the weight vector. Another form of relevance you can also compute here is to say, answer the question, how can I take the output, y in this case, and apportion it across the dimensions of my input? And here, uh, one answer you can sort of obtain here is to say, I'm going to do a line one wise products of the weights times the um, actual feature dimension itself. And so these two notions of relevance, the sensitivity that we just described, which is in the form of the input gradient, and the gradient times input here will actually translate into the uh, deep neural network setting. So the to sort of set up notation, we'll consider F would be mapping from RD to RC. Think of this as a standard supervised classification setting where C is the number of classes that you have. And then one primitive we'll need here is a F of I, which is a load. You can think of it as a function that maps from the input to a particular scalar, which is a class-specific logic. So the logits are the output of your network that you actually feed into the soft knife function to get the probabilities that go into your loss. So the first saliency map technique we'll consider is the input gradient, and this is the gradient of the logit, class-specific logit, which respect, this is the derivative of the class-specific logit with respect to the input. And so this input gradient is an RD, which is the same size as your input. So you can visualize it in the form of a heat map. And there are a few challenges that you can sort of, uh, that you have with this input gradient. One of them is uh, known in the literature as either gradient saturation or sensitivity uh, issue. And here what happens is it's possible for you to go from a, an input to another input. So you could go from a baseline input to another input which induces a change in F, whereas the gradient does not change. This presumably could be because the function is flat along, uh, around the particular input that you're interpreting, or it could be that um, the gradient is just saturated up uh, around that point. So this is a potentially undesirable property of the gradient, so several other methods have been proposed to counteract this. One of them is smooth grad. And so smooth grad is a simple modification of the gradient. So you can think of smooth grad as you have an input you want to explain, you create n copies of this input, add Gaussian noise, and then you compute in input gradient for all n copies and average them. This is what smooth grad uh, does. And you can visualize the smooth grad visualization as shown. And what you observe here is that the input, the silly map is a little more coherent than the actual um, input gradient salinity map. So let's keep going. We can also consider um, integrated gradients. And here, integrated gradients also uh, counteracts the sensitivity issue that you have with the input gradient. And what integrated gradient essentially corresponds to is a path integral from a baseline. So you can think of this baseline as an input where your function um, sort of gives an 
output that is that you can sort of think of as zero. So it's sort of a generic input that you want to attribute to. So in a gradient gradient cor uh, corresponds to a uh, pad integral from this baseline all the way to an input of interest. And in practice, that usually trend, uh, uh, corresponds to sort of interpolating from the baseline and computing an input gradient for all your different interpolants and summing them up. So here is a visualization of what an integrated gradient salinity map looks, looks like in practice. So another uh, technique is the gradient uh, element-wise multiplied by the input. And this is analogous to the input gradient um, multiplied by the input that we saw for the linear model. And so here's a visualization of the gradient uh, element-wise product of, uh, with the input. And one interesting uh, thing here is that several other methods have actually been shown to be equivalent under spe uh, specific settings. So for example, having a ReLU network or zero baseline to the input grade, uh, to the gradient times input. So let's now shift gears a little bit to consider methods that uh, are, we'll sort of refer to as modified backward approaches. So what those methods are is, so if you think of the input gradient, you can compute the input gradient by just uh, one sort of uh, issuing one backward pass in your favorite uh, auto diff language. So it's either as a TF, you can call TF gradients, a uh, few calls to backward in PyTorch or even um, your favorite auto diff package, and you can sort of obtain the input gradient. And modified backward approaches, what they do is they modify the backward process to compute a different feature relevance using other kinds of rules. So let's say you have a ReLU network and the activation uh, uh, sort of formulation is shown at, at, as follows. When you actually backpropagate to a ReLU network, you have to take into account the forward ReLU uh, that you applied originally. And so you can have a method that's called guided backpropagation, which is a saliency map technique. And what this method does is modifies the regular backpropagation approach. And the key modification is that it zeroes out the negative gradients during the backpropagation um, iteration. And so um, this simple change actually makes uh, sort of drastic changes in this behavior of the guided backprop saliency map. And so here is a visualization of the guided backward saliency map, and you can see that it's more sparse than the original input gradient that we considered. Another category of methods that belongs in the modified backward approach is the layer relevance propagation. And so this is a family of methods that are sort of decompose the output. So you can think of the output here as the logic iteratively via backward propagation all the way to the input. And like I mentioned, what is different about those approaches is they specify a variety of rules for how you how you actually backpropagate relevance from the output all the way to the output. And each different rule actually gives you a different saliency map. So we're showing four different rules here, the zero, epsilon rule, and two other rules as well. So given that we've looked at quite a few methods in a sort of rapid succession, let's do a recap. So we considered Lime and SHAP originally. These are surrogate methods that approximate your model around a single input and then explain the approximation. And then we looked at a variety of saliency map techniques like the input gradient, guided backprop, integrated gradient, the gradient elements wise times the input, and a variety of different LRP uh, versions as well. While this um, is quite a number of methods, they are actually only a selection of the saliency map techniques that are out there. And we'll refer you to this work by Samek and Montavon um, from earlier this year that gives a pretty nice summary of several different methods in this area. So now that concludes the discussion on the saliency map techniques. Let's do an overview of what we now call prototype or example-based methods. So prototype methods, you can think of these methods as methods that are explain a model with examples. And so these methods can answer questions like what input um, are misclassified in the training, are mislabeled in the training set, or questions like generate a synthetic example that maximally activates a particular neuron, or sort of answer a question of the sort, what kind of input is my model most likely to have a high test loss on? And so one method that we'll actually look uh, a little bit in detail on is training point ranking by influence functions. So this method can answer a question of the sort, 
which training data points have the most influence on the test loss of this Junko bird example. And so let's say you sort of, uh, sort of compute this method, it can give you a ranking of all of, all of your training points according to your influence on the test loss of the Junko bird example you're seeing. And let's say you get an answer of this sort. And these are all Junko bird examples. If you're a model developer to train this model, you can look at these examples and sort of have more confidence in your model that it's relying on sort of um, the right semantic type uh, features in order to determine that this uh, input is a Junko bird. And so these are these are the ways you can use to sort of diagnose the model. So the influence function is actually a, a classic tool in uh, robust statistics that is used to uh, in regression diagnostics. So it sort of answers the question, what is the influence of a, it helps you answer the question, what is the influence of a particular training point on my parameter setting? So in the schematic that we're showing here, you have on the left uh, regret, uh, a bunch of data points where we fit uh, a linear regression model, and you can see that because of the outlier red point, the regression uh, fit actually compensates for that and sort of tries to incorporate that in the in the in the model. If you remove this data point and then you refit your regression your regression line, you see that you actually have a different fit. And here you can say that the outlier point red has a high influence on the regression parameters. And so here, Cook and Weisberg actually. Um, sort of offered an analytical formula for actually deriving the influence of a data point instead of actually refitting the model without that particular data point. And this is actually a classic tool called Cook's, Cook's Distance that is used very uh, widely in the linear regression literature. And so what Ko and Liang did in a paper from my in 2017 is to bring this insight in a very a nice paper to a modern machine learning setting. And so let's say we have ZI in this case that indexes our training set. ZJ is a training point that we want to sort of estimate, we want to sort of estimate the influence of ZJ. And Z test is a test example of interest as well. So in machine learning, we typically um, sort of have a training set and we sort of solve the empirical risk minimization problem and to obtain our parameters. So let's say you do that on the left, you have the traditional uh, ERM solution, let's say theta hat with all your training points. What you can then do on the right is operate an example ZJ by epsilon and then recompute your ERM solution theta hat epsilon ZJ. Note here that if you set epsilon to negative one over n, it actually corresponds to removing ZJ and estimating a, 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 an ERM solution that actually is without ZJ. So the influence of ZJ here will be the difference between theta hat and theta hat epsilon ZJ. And so what Ko and, uh, Ko and Liang did in their 2017 paper is to provide analytical uh, formulas for the influence of the training point ZJ on the parameters, which is the negative Hessian inverse here, times the, the, the vector which corresponds to the, the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters. And then you can also compute the influence of the training point on the input's test loss. For the particular last point, you can use this sort of computation to then rank all of the training points by their influence on a particular test law, on a particular test example that you're interested in. And so you can use this approach to sort of identify mislabeled examples, possibly diagnose domain mismatch, and even in a in a nice uh, in a nice demonstration to also craft uh, test time uh, training time training uh, poisoning examples. So there are a few challenges with this approach. Actually, uh, one of them is with respect to scalability. As we all know, deep neural networks have lots of parameters, and and so computing Hessians for for these things is usually uh, generally infeasible. So you have to resort to Hessian vector products in order to compute. Um, the influence, and this can be somewhat tedious in practice. Another issue was raised in a recent paper of Basu et al. this year that showed that you know, the influence approximation can be quite loose for non-convex losses, especially if you have models that are quite um, have several different layers. So there are a few alternatives that have been proposed in the literature. One of them is a representer points by Ye et al. and NERPS in 2018, and another recent work uh, called track in by Proteatol appearing at this NURBS. So 
that sort of uh, is one, what we just discussed is one kind of uh, prototype explanation uh, approach. Another paradigm is the activ activation maximization approach. And these approaches, you can think of them as identifying examples that maximally sort of strongly activate a neuron or an intermediate function of interest. They're typically applied to deep neural networks. And there are two sort of approaches for sort of computing this kind of examples. One of them is for you to search in a particular corpus. So search in your training set, a validation set on a user provided corpus and identify examples that actually strongly activate a particular neuron. Another one is to actually synthesize a new example uh, in the uh, sort of via gradient descent or an iterative optimization process that maximally activates a particular neuron. So here's a visualization derived from the work of Ola et al. in 2017 that shows both of these approaches. In the first row, we see data set examples that sort of act strongly activate a particular neuron. And then on the bottom row, we see um, sort of synthetic examples that were generated via an iterative optimization process to actually maximize uh, the uh, maximize, act, they strongly maximize a particular neuron. So these are sort of two approaches that fit under this uh, paradigm as well. So now that concludes our discussion on prototype examples, and we'll move to a discussion on 